Let us pray. Well, Father God, we we stand in awe before you this morning. We stand in awe before you as the God of all creation. The God who not only creates but sustains all things. Who not only sustains all things but will subject all things under your authority. Lord, we look forward to that day when under your authority fully and finally this world is complete. No longer tainted by sin but healed. A resurrected creation along with us, your resurrected creation. Lord, what a blessing to know that in Christ we have life abundant and we have life abundant now and forevermore. And what a blessing to know that amidst those gifts, those gifts given by grace to wretches like us, you want to use us. You desire that we submit to you that we might be used by you. Not as unwilling slaves, but as willing participants in the redemptive work that you have laid forth, that plan that you have had from the beginning, knowing full well that we are not saved by works, but we are created to do good things, to do good works, and that that's a, a blessing, a burden, yes, but a burden of blessing, that we humble, fallen, broken, sinful creatures might be used by you, might be the method that you choose to advance the gospel throughout the world. That is a humbling thought, Lord. And so I pray this morning that as we come and gather, we would be prepared, we would be equipped for the good works, for the ministries that you have laid before each and every one of us, some ministries that we can gather together to accomplish and some that we'll go off on our own to accomplish. What a blessing, Lord, to be used by you and to be called to this place to be equipped for that using. Lord, we thank you. We thank you in the precious and wonderful name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn with me this morning to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. I'll give you a minute to turn there since I didn't give you much warning through the bulletin this morning. And I'll start by saying good morning. Uh, I didn't get a chance to say good morning to everybody as I like to. We were running a little late. And I won't say whose fault that was, but it wasn't Elise or the kids' fault. So I'll just leave it at that. But I apologize for running a little late and not having that time, but looking forward to some fellowship after the service with you. Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Verse 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Verse 35. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that it wa its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth below can be explored. Then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. 
Let us pray. Oh, Father God, I thank you that we have this prophecy of a new covenant. And we have also here this encouragement. An encouragement that's meant to say that you, Lord, will never forget your people Israel. That you will never cast them off. And Lord, we know in hindsight, we know from the Apostle Paul, Lord, that you have set Israel aside for a time. That now is the dispensation of grace in which your people are the body of Christ. That universal church of all members bonded together in faith and the blood of Christ. But there is a time coming. There is a time coming in which these promises will finally be fulfilled, will finally be manifested for a national people, for Israel an Israel that is gathered together at a time of desperation for the world, in which they need a strong Israel, and will at last, by your grace and your mercy, see a strong Israel, fulfilling what they are called to do to be a light to the Gentiles, a light to all nations. Lord, I'm grateful too for this passage, because this passage, this new covenant, is not just a covenant for Israel. The spiritual blessings here, Lord, apply to the body of Christ. There's promises of land, that's for Israel, but promises of having your law written on our hearts and on our minds, that applies to us today. The Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear through his revelation to the Apostle Paul that we are to participate in the Lord's Supper, and in doing so we participate in the new covenant that is found in his blood. All of this, Lord, is to say that you are a faithful God. A faithful God, despite our many failings, despite our shortcomings, whether we're national Israel or the body of Christ. And Lord, I pray this morning that you would help all of us in our times of need, in our times of crisis, in our times of failure, to know that you are a faithful God. A faithful God who allows us to have a relationship with you. And through that relationship comes not just obedience, but reconciliation and blessing. Father God, I want to thank you for the pain that so many of us suffer. The grief that so many of us go through. The despair. Because all of that, Lord's Lord, points us to your goodness. It points us to the goodness of a Savior. It points us to the good news that you will make all things right again. Father, I want to lift up Don and Sally as they continue to mourn and to grieve. I want to lift up even our neighbors as they continue to mourn and grieve the loss of their daughter from the car accident not that long ago, Lord for all those who are grieving, for all those who are walking through that desert of grief and going through those trials, Lord, I pray that your presence would be known, that your love would be manifested for them in powerful and recognizable ways. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple things to mention in way of announcements. We do have some fellowship time, of course, after the service, as we always do. There's always an open invitation to spend as much time as you like here and, and just enjoy each other's company and time together. Uh, but there are some cards to be signed on the table. Everyone's invited, of course, to sign those cards. Let those that we're sending them to know you're thinking of them, that you love them. So please feel uh, encouraged to do that, participate in that. Another thing I want to mention is the Grace Gospel Fellowship is putting on a summer picnic. I've got these handouts, uh, but I'm not going to give them to you quite yet. I'll put one up on the bulletin board there, but I'll hand these out sometime in the weeks to come. It's a picnic coming in August. So we've got some time, but I'm mentioning it now. It's going to be a picnic at Hager Park on August 12th. August 12th, you might want to mark that in your calendars. It's an invite for all churches. Uh, there's hamburgers, hot dogs, drinks provided. Uh, you're encouraged to bring a dish, but even if you can't bring a dish, you're still invited to come. So just be mindful of that. Maybe mark that in your calendar. August 12th, there will be a picnic. Again, I'll have the information posted up there. And uh, sometime in the future, maybe closer to that event, I'll hand some of these out so we can have that uh, point of reminder. So at this point, I'll turn it over to our worship team to continue leading us in worship this morning. 
Jesus is absolutely amazing. He is wonderful. He is perfect. He is truth. He is life. He is salvation. And he came to a specific people at a specific time with a specific offer. The kingdom of God. An offer of a new way of doing things. A new way of living. An upside down kingdom without borders that is subversive and provocative and profoundly good. And his kingdom is not yet fully realized. It was offered and it was rejected. And Christ remains king, but king who's limited in his rule even today. That realization, that culmination of the kingdom is for a future time. But in his teachings, he showed his followers what it meant to be part of that kingdom, what it meant to be in subjection to him as king, what it means to follow him. And we as the body of Christ, that is Christ's representatives and servants and followers in this dispensation of grace, we ought to live as Jesus lived. We're called and compelled all throughout the New Testament to live as Christ lived, to be like Christ. And as he called his kingdom people to live he, a certain way, he also gave an example of how to live that way. And so we can see in these kingdom teachings truth for us today. Truth for us today is what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be in the body of Christ, what it means to be his ambassadors and his representatives. And so we've come to the Sermon on the Mount. We've come to these teachings of Jesus on how to live in response to his declaration of God's reign, to better learn what it means to follow Jesus. And so we turn to Matthew chapter 5 this morning, and a little bit later in the message, we'll also look back to Jeremiah 31, that portion that I read earlier. So Matthew 5 and Jeremiah 31 become our text this morning. And we've considered the crowd that was around Jesus. These people who are poor and sick and ostracized. These people who hold no value socially or politically or religiously, at least in the eyes of the world. But it is they that Jesus calls blessed. It is they that will inherit the world, that will see God face to face, that will be his sons and daughters. And he calls his followers salt and light. We looked at that last week. That his followers will be distinct from the people in other kingdoms, and worldly kingdoms, and what we might call Babylon. Whatever name it might regionally go by in any area. And these followers are to influence the world through that distinction, through remaining holy and set apart. And now, as we'll see today, Jesus explains in more detail what it is to be part of this upside-down kingdom. These passages that we're getting to are often called the ethical teachings of Jesus. And there's truth to that. They are ethical teachings of Jesus, but they're not just ethical teachings. They're a part of this kingdom announcement. And his kingdom announcement is about God's people coming under the rule and the reign of their king and finding their whole orientation to the world to be turned upside down, to be different, to be unique. Jesus is setting up an alternate community where the value system is completely different than any other community you'll find in the world. Where the highest values are generosity and peacemaking and humility and service. And we find ourselves in this place in society where we're thousands of years removed from these teachings. It's been a while, and, and we are all participants in Western culture, if we want to speak broadly about it, which is so richly saturated with the teachings of Christ that even modern secularists, humanists, will point to these values like generosity and peacemaking and humility and service. And they'll say, well, those are moral qualities for today. But all of those people borrow. 
They borrow from the Lord Jesus Christ. They borrow from our worldview because without Christ, without his intervention into the world to teach these values to his people, without a history of his people trying their best to strive for this, even in the face of a world that wants to tear apart these values, that's what establishes those values in society. So that even people can reject Christ but can't get away from his teachings. They can't get away from his values. But it is only the follower of Jesus that can truly begin to understand why these things are important, why we buck against the trends of the world, and can begin to justify these values as good and worthy of pursuing. Jesus invites us into a very different world, a very different kingdom, a very different body. In a lot of ways, it's like traveling to England, you know, one of the first things you'll notice that reminds you that you're in a different country is all of the people driving on the wrong side of the road. And I say the wrong side of the road not just as an arrogant American, but most countries drive on the right side of the road. There's just a few, like England, where you drive on the left side. And that's a pretty clear reminder that it's a different place. As soon as you step out of the airport or whatever brings you there, you're going to notice that. You're going to notice the traffic. I wonder how many accidents are caused just by tourists arriving and not quite getting that and being able to handle that. You know, you go so long, you go your entire life with the turn signal on one side, and the steering wheel on one side, and traffic patterns going certain ways, it becomes quite jarring, I assume. You can imagine yourself being there. Even if you haven't been there, I've never been, but you can imagine yourself. And everything, at least in terms of driving, might seem upside down or at least reversed and backwards. Driving in the left lane, again, the steering wheel on the wrong side and turn signals in the wrong places, and you're used to left turns being the more complicated and difficult turns, and all of a sudden it's the right turns that are more complicated and difficult. It's completely disorienting. It's the upside-down United Kingdom. And I think in some way that reminds me of the upside-down kingdom that Christ invites people to. There are similarities there to what Jesus is asking of his people in this upside-down kingdom. And he spends so much time on this and on these teachings because they are counterintuitive, because they're just not, they're not the kind of things, what Jesus says here, they're not the kind of things that you just hear for the first time and go, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That's pretty status quo. It's like learning to drive on the wrong side of the road. And the difference between this and England is you're driving on the other side of the road while nobody else is. You're driving against oncoming traffic if you pursue Christ the way he calls us to pursue him. He's trying to teach a new way to be human. And some of that will overlap the ways we do things, but most of it ultimately points out just how broken we are in the ways that we live. But Jesus is not gathering his people together and saying, okay, let's all move to this landmass that's unoccupied and we'll start a little kingdom, a little nation there. He's not calling us to do that. What he expects is that his followers will be part of this upside down kingdom within the context of worldly kingdoms, within the context of other cultures that will be out in the world with our day-to-day -day lives, with our relationships as we pursue being salt and light which we talked about last week. And it would be, to keep the analogy going just a little bit further, as I've mentioned already, like deciding before we left here, all of us would agree, okay, we're going to leave Georgetown Grace Church, and we're all going to agree that we're now driving on the left side of the road. And so you don't just have one car doing it, but you have multiple cars doing it, multiple people doing it, and that's going to lead to very quickly, probably right here at this intersection, collision. It's going to cause problems. It's going to cause friction. And Jesus is challenging us to go into the collision, to go into the fray of that, to do what is absolutely bold. It takes a lot of guts to drive in the wrong lane of traffic. And that's what he's talk, telling us to do in terms of how we live our lives and how we think about ourselves. He's challenging us to, to go into our world, not to leave it, not to go to some kingdom where everybody is driving on that side of the road, but to go here and to be different, and to be distinct, to be flavorful salt, and to be bright light on a hill. 
to be members of a new and a different kind of kingdom with an upside down value system, to go there and to live there. And that's collision, that's tension, that's conflict, that's dangerous, that might just get you killed. Look at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7. The end of the Sermon on the Mount, we'll start there, chapter 7. Verse 28 and verse 29. Chapter 7, verse 28. And when Jesus finished these sayings, okay, so unpacking all this kingdom of God language and teachings, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. We can stop there, we can ask, well, why? Why are they astonished at his teachings? Why that reaction? Why jaw-dropped reaction to what Jesus is saying? Verse 29, because he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Jesus teaches as if he has authority. Well, why does that astonish people? Why does that amaze people? Well, it's because they already had an existing authority in their culture, which is called the law. It's called the Torah. We need to think here in a different sense of law than what we usually think of. We need to think of law in the sense that a first century Jewish person would think of it. We, we have to think biblically about law. Law like as we see it in verse 17 of our text. If you look at Matthew 5, verse 17, this passage, this section begins with the law. Verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The Hebrew word there is Torah. At its core, Torah means teaching or instruction. And for the Jews, it was also used to reference the first five books of the Bible, what some might call the books of Moses, what we often in the Christian circles call the Pentateuch, those first five books. That's Torah. But even more specifically than that, within those five books, Torah is also all the laws, all the commandments that God gives his people. It's all those passages which contain those commandments and those laws. There's the ones we know, probably memorized for many of us, the Ten Commandments, but there's 603 other commandments in the Torah. Rules for how to live as God's chosen people, Israel. Some of these laws are moral, don't murder. Some of them are ceremonial, eat this and this on Passover. Some of them are civil. You know, if you have a flat roof that people go on, build a fence around it so people don't fall off and get hurt. Some of them are sacrificial. You sacrifice this animal for this reason and this animal on this day. Some of them are about ritual cleanliness. If you touched a dead body, Take this kind of bath, separate yourself from people for this amount of time. This Torah, these first five books, their narrative and their commands become the heart of Israel's faith and life. That's God's word. That is where the people go to learn God's will. So what stuns people? as Jesus finishes these teachings, is how he teaches these things. The way he talks about Torah. The way he talks about the law. Because as Jesus does that, he sets himself as an authority that is totally independent from teachers of the Torah. It's totally independent. It's different than what the Pharisees and the scribes do. Because the Pharisees and scribes say, this is God's word, this is the Torah, this is what he says, this is what the prophets point to. And they point to scripture as the authority. It's the exact same thing that I'm doing. What I'm doing right now illustrates this quite well because, because I don't know very much. And I try hard to not pretend that I know very much. And really there's no particular reason why you should listen to anything I say. And with that in mind, you should all go home every Sunday and do your homework and say, okay, what did he say? And look to this and check me and make sure I'm doing all right. 
because I don't think you should listen to me. I think you should listen to Scripture. And I think you should listen to those moments where the Holy Spirit speaks through me, where I'm not speaking through me. But those moments are only discernible by comparing them to Scripture, to the Word of God. So I do my best to unpack this because we accept this. We accept Scripture as authority over the community of disciples that we are. This podium here, this pulpit, is not to elevate me, it's to elevate Scripture. I hide behind it as the Word of God is elevated here before you. And Jesus stands up. And he doesn't preach the way I preach. He doesn't explain Scripture the way the scribes explain Scripture, saying this, this is the authority. He says, I'm the authority. He is the Word of God. He is the Scriptures. He says, I have some things to teach you. And you need to pay attention to this. And you need to pay attention to it as if you are hearing the will of God. As if you are hearing the Word of God. And that stuns people. I hope it would stun you anytime you heard somebody else doing that. Because there's only one person who has the authority to do it, and that's Jesus. And the questions that come from this is he stands there and he speaks as if he is the authority that's found in the Torah. As he speaks that way, the question is, well, who is this guy? Where did this guy come from? Where does he think he gets this authority to do this? And it leads to a collision there. A collision of values and authority. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus sits down for dinner with Matthew, a tax collector, and some other tax collectors and some sinners, and that upsets the Pharisees. And of course it does, because tax collectors are seen as traitors. They are, at some level, aligned with Rome, more so than they're aligned with Israel. They spend so much time with the Gentiles, with soldiers, with government officials, that Almost none of them bother to eat kosher, at least if it's just them and the Gentiles there having their lunch break. And they use their position to enrich themselves, oftentimes stealing from their very own people to enrich themselves. They do that at the expense of them. And sometimes it's not quite stealing, sometimes it's just rules that allow them to profit according to the law. And so here Jesus, here's Jesus saying that he's representing God's kingdom. And he's offering it here to all the wrong people. The Pharisees can see that. They can say, well, he says he's offering God's kingdom. But there he is eating with tax collectors. It's an absurd notion. In Matthew 12, Jesus is walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And he and his disciples become angry. And so they begin to pick and eat some of the heads of grain, which was common practice. People do that all the time, but not on the Sabbath. Because then you're harvesting, then you're working on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees see this and they say, whoa, 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 look, Jesus, you and your disciples, what you're doing is not lawful on the Sabbath. They say, you're breaking Torah, Jesus. You're breaking the law of God. You're working on the Sabbath. Jesus sets himself up as an authority to teach independently. But in addition to the Torah... The question, well, where did Jesus get this authority, causes some major conflicts. Not just in the ministry of Jesus, but even in the development of the body church, all the way to, to today. Christianity began as this Jewish messianic renewal movement within Judaism, completely confined to Judaism. Any Gentile involvement until the Apostle Paul gets on the scene is Gentile involvement in Israel, within Judaism. And it's only, the, it's only when this movement begins to collect a bunch of non-Jewish disciples and the dispensation of grace as it's transitioning there that the whole question came up, well, if I'm not Jewish, what's my relationship to the Torah? What's my relationship to these Jewish books and Jewish scrolls and Jewish rules? What's my relationship to that? Because I'm a Gentile and I'm all on board for Jesus. I love this Jesus guy. But 
I also like wearing two kinds of fabrics, and I like planting two kinds of seeds in my field like my ancestors have always done, and I like my pork sandwiches. But I also like Jesus, and so where do I fit in that? And it's not just a theological question, it's practical too. Where does one go to find God's will? Where does one go to find God's will for their life and how to live as a follower of Jesus? For what it means to be a genuine image bearer of God in the light of all these truths. To be a human being. Do I go to the words of the scriptures? Do I go to the words of those that Jewish Torah? Do I go to the words of Jesus? Or to both? And, and if both, how do those two relate to each other? The Torah and the words of Jesus. Jesus sees this collision coming. He knows it's coming. It's happening there just within the Jewish community, but I think he has the knowledge to know that there's coming a day when this teaching is going to be quite relevant for people like us, Gentiles, who don't probably know very many Jewish believers, if any Jewish believers at all. Where do we go to find out how we're supposed to live? And what he addresses in this paragraph here in Matthew addresses that. And so we'll begin exploring that today. I'd like to read verse 17 once more. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Well, when he includes the prophets there, he's referring to the other main section of Hebrew scriptures, the law and the prophets. It was a common way of referring to all of scripture. Sometimes you'd say the law and the prophets to mean all of the Bible, all of the Old Testament, or you'd say the law and the prophets and the writings, and sometimes you'd add in a little caveat there for the poetry. But either way, you're referring to all of the Old Testament scriptures. And so that's what Jesus is talking about. He came to not abolish, but fulfill all of Scripture, all of the narrative, all of the prophecy, all of the commandments, all of the rules, all of the Jewish Scriptures. Jesus says, don't think that I've come to undermine any of this. And if he has to say that, don't think I'm undermining any of this. There's the assumption there that everybody thinks that he's doing that exact thing. Everybody's listening to Jesus and they're saying, he's throwing out the law, he's throwing out the Torah, he wants nothing to do with that. Pharisees especially would be thinking that. He says, I didn't come to undermine them, I came to fulfill them. I didn't come to destroy them, I came to build them up. I didn't come to, dis to cause destruction, but growth and enrichment and nourishment in the light of the Torah. And so it makes sense to us, I think, that Jesus fulfilled the prophets. The prophecies that the Messiah would do X, Y, and Z. The only thing you need to know is, well, did Jesus do X, Y, and Z? If he did, then he fulfilled the prophets. And we've talked before on how amazing it is how Jesus has fulfilled all of the prophecies concerning him. Unbelievably impossible for anybody to do it on accident or anybody to even try to do it unless they're Jesus of Nazareth. But, so we won't spend a lot of time on that. But hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophecies, and he checks off every one. But Jesus claims not just to fulfill the prophets, but also Torah, the law, the commandments. And again, we are looking at this so that we can best understand where we go to discern God's will for living as a disciple and as a human being. God calls together a people out of the nations to be his chosen people. They're called to be distinct from the other nations and to draw the other nations to him, to God. Well, how well did they do with that? With that calling? Well, terribly. They botched it completely. They basically did none of it ever. They totally failed. They run their nation into the ground and they end up in exiled foreign territory. Because of their failures to do what they were called to do. And so Israel had walked away. Israel had rejected God. Time and time and time and time again, Israel rejects God. But he doesn't walk away from them. He doesn't walk away from their promises to them. 
That's a core teaching of us, that God is faithful to Israel for all time. He never abandons them. They're never done with completely. He's faithful to them when they are unfaithful, just as he's faithful to us when we are unfaithful. The whole story is not done yet. And so that's where this new covenant comes in, where God says there's a new covenant coming. Jeremiah the prophet says that there's a new covenant coming. Chapter 31, starting in verse 31. Chapter 31 of Jeremiah, verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, a new arrangement, a new agreement, a new contract, a new covenant with the people of Israel, with the people of Ju Judah, a covenant with all of my people united again. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. It's going to be different. There's the old covenant, there's the new covenant. It's different. When I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. Verse 33 here. I will put my Torah in their minds and write my Torah on their hearts. I will be their God. And they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. This here, what God is putting forth here through Jeremiah, is a new and distinct covenant. The terms are different. But are we doing away with the Torah? Are we doing away with the commandments with this covenant? Well, no. It's the exact opposite of that. The Torah is going to be written on minds and hearts. So it's still there. The law is still there. But its role is changing. The role of these commandments is changing. And some will change differently than others change. It's no longer about this written code that you have to obey. It's about God doing something to embed and internalize his will on the hearts of his people. And that embedding of the motivation and the desire and knowledge of how to live as a human before God becomes an expression of relationship. Jeremiah continues there. I will be their God. And they will be my people. They will know what to do because there will be this degree of closeness and connection that will make obedience no longer a duty but a joy. And it will make it an expression of what is actually deep inside of us. It's a renovation of the heart, the human heart. You don't have to compel obedience. God is going to do something that makes obedience more natural. Not completely natural, but more natural as he restores the heart. And what is that thing? How on earth do you do something like that? Do you get somebody to that place where obedience isn't a burden, it isn't a duty, but it's something that comes from the heart, which Jeremiah also tells us is full of wickedness and despair, that out of the heart comes nothing good. Well, it's that last part of Jeremiah 31. Verse 35, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. This is profound, but it's also practical. I wonder if you've ever experienced what it's like to hurt somebody that you care about and, and then have that person forgive you. When you've had this relationship where you've really messed up and you've messed up pretty bad and, and that person that you've hurt, that person you've sinned against comes to you to forgive you despite you not deserving it in any way. Maybe you haven't had an experience like that, but I've, I've had plenty in my life. And what happens, what happens that moment to your heart posture, if you will, before those people? 
I think so often, at least in my experience, that process forms a bond that is stronger than what you had before. Out of that brokenness comes something profoundly beautiful. And forgiveness is a really unnatural thing to do with someone. You look to the animal world, there's no forgiveness to be found there. You upset the wrong ape in your little clan there, you will get beaten to death. There's no forgiveness. There's affection at times, there's love at times, even between animals. You can see that, but forgiveness is not something you see in the natural world. It's unnatural. It's a uniquely human thing because it's a uniquely divine thing. And you can find yourself in those situations where someone's forgiven you and suddenly you want to do right by them. You want to make things right to restore things. They've forgiven you, but you still feel compelled to do above and beyond what you can to make things right, to be righteous before them, right before them, to honor them. And, and that comes out of care and gratefulness for what they did for you. Yeah, may, maybe you haven't experienced that, but I have on multiple occasions in my life. And that's what Jeremiah is talking about. God is going to move his people in such a great act of forgiveness that all of a sudden the demands of the Torah will be less about what you have to obey. And it's going to internalize it in a deep renovation of the heart so that obedience begins to come naturally. And it all centers on a great act of forgiveness of God moving toward his people. And these promises of Jeremiah, they're given. Jeremiah proclaims this and they get written down and they just sit there. For a long time, they sit there unfulfilled. God says, I'm going to give a new covenant. And then no new covenant comes. It just lingers there. And Jesus comes out of the scene. And this is precisely the kind of promise that Jesus sees himself picking up and bringing into reality. Jesus sees himself forming this Jeremiah 31 people this new covenant people. He said this clearly at the Last Supper. It's what we remember every time we take communion along with his death we, we, that brings these blessings forth. We remember the sacrifice and we remember the forgiveness, but we always do it remembering what the Apostle Paul said, that we do it because that blood is the new covenant. Jesus gave that new covenant to his disciples. And you would expect it to stay there. You'd expect, okay, Jeremiah 31, that is a blessing for Israel. That's a blessing for, okay, the kingdom church. That's a blessing for Jesus and his disciples. It's Jew-focused. And then somewhere along the line, Jesus says, hey, Paul, I want you to give this to the body of Christ as well. And he does. We see that in 1 Corinthians 11. So that we can participate in the new covenant. We don't expect the blessings of land that are promised here, which we didn't focus on, but those things, like the law being written on the heart and the mind of God forgiving us, that's the big one there. We participate in that. We cannot say that because of the death of Christ, we are forgiven without invoking language that is found so strongly here in Jeremiah 31. Over the next few weeks, we'll see that Jesus is calling his people to do what he is doing, which is fulfilling the Torah. Jesus calls his people to be obedient to the law. It's not simply about obeying the laws. It's about allowing Jesus to begin that renovation of the heart. Jesus, we will see, comes along, and he seems to contradict at times the Torah, but ultimately he doesn't. What he does is he adds his teaching alongside it. And his teaching, which happens to be equal authority, sits there alongside of it. And what he teaches actually fulfills the intent and the purpose of the command. Jesus never abolishes the authority of the command, but he brings it to a new degree of fulfillment, fulfilling the purpose of the law as he brings about the new covenant. And the people of the new covenant are those members of this upside down kingdom where we drive on the other side of the road. It's these people that are being shaped into Jeremiah 31 kind of people. And again, note the body of Christ receives these spiritual blessings. We are Jeremiah 31 people. 
They're being shaped into this people, and with that comes collisions and tensions and sometimes disaster as we face Babylon, as we face the cultures of this world. Because so much of Jesus' calling into how to live is beautifully counterintuitive. Those 613 commands were God's will for ancient Israel. They were for a time and they were for a place. And they were good and they are good. Not all of them apply to us today. That's a conversation that I was thinking of having today. And maybe we can discuss that outside the sermon of what laws apply and don't. But they are all good laws. They're all there for a good purpose. But they all point us to what has been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now God's people grow accustomed to living Jeremiah 31 lives together as his people. And there's this balance that Jesus is trying to strike here because one might be tempted to say, okay, well, let's just get rid of the Old Testament then and all of those rules and all of those laws. But, but Jesus says, not so fast. Matthew 5, verse 18. Matthew 5, verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. In the Hebrew language, there's these tiny little dots that can change one letter to a completely different letter and therefore change one word to a completely different word. Just the tiniest little dot, a little tiniest stroke that can change an entire word. And Jesus says, not even those tiny tiny little strokes, the smallest pen stroke in all of scripture that's found in Hebrew writing, that will never pass away, not until heaven and earth pass away. There's a lot to be said about that that might be a conversation for a different time, but God is faithful to his people in that. The Torah remains a statement of God's will until everything is accomplished, and Jesus is the one who brings forward that accomplishment. Verse 19, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The law in the Torah is not second rate. They are to be learned from. They are to be meditated upon. They are to be understood in the context of Jesus and the kingdom and the new covenant and the body of Christ. Paul says all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The scripture he's referencing is Torah. It is the writings. It is the prophets. Jesus calls his people to do and teach them. But what we do with them is a little different if now they've been fulfilled in Jesus. And so there's room for some clarification to be made. There's room to wrestle with how laws apply now, what laws apply now. And Jesus gives us some clarification here. Verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, some of us might read that and think, well, well, shoot, I'm done for. That's it for me. I'm never going to have a righteousness like the scribes and the Pharisees who are the righteous of righteous. Unless your righteousness exceeds the most religious and pious of Torah scholars, you're done for. So the question is, well, what on earth are we supposed to do? And if you're thinking that way, the assumption that you're making and thinking that way is that Jesus is calling us to play the Pharisee game, to be like Pharisees. And if you've read the Gospels, you certainly know that Jesus probably isn't calling you to be like a Pharisee because he's no big fan of theirs. But of course, Jesus, so he's not doing that, but he's consistently rebuking the Pharisees in their pursuit of righteousness. Instead, what Jesus is doing is he's giving them the example. He's saying, the most righteous person you can think of, you have to be more righteous than them. And ultimately, that's Jesus calling his disciples to nothing less than a renovation of the heart. 
Because the Pharisees were righteous, but not through the heart, just through pure obedience and will. And we come here to what I must humbly admit seems to be paradoxical in my mind. In the next few weeks, Jesus will expose issues of pride and lust and contempt and deception. And he'll expose deep core issues about the state of our hearts and minds. And he will call us, even through that, to a higher degree of faith and faithfulness and righteousness than what seems possible. It's as if Jesus is saying, there's no hope for you unless you're more righteous than the more, most righteous person you can think of, but also you are wicked beyond, beyond any hope. And so we have to wrestle with that. Well, what is Jesus saying? If we have to be perfectly righteous, let's say, but we're perfectly wicked, what do we do with that? What do we do with that? And it is paradoxical, and it becomes less so in light of what we know is coming for Jesus in his sacrifice, in light of what we know about the nature of salvation and that he becomes sin, we become his righteousness. But that's a conversation, I think, for another time. The last thing that Jesus commands for his people, though, is that they be perfect as the Father is perfect. And in that, you can become crushed by Jesus' teachings. A lot of people have been crushed by that. How on earth can I be perfect when I'm so broken? And Jesus isn't joking. There's no hyperbole there. He fully expects his followers to really, truly try to follow that goal, pursue that goal, to be perfect, to be sinless knowing full well that they can't do it. If we hold on to that paradox, and we hold on to that and cling on to that in the next few weeks, I think things will come together for us. If we hold on to that in light of the teachings of the Apostle Paul and even the Gospel authors and what the cross means for us, it'll begin to come together. But I want to end with this, and I think this is an important piece. And that's Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, verse 34 and following. We can go through each of the laws, 613 of them, and say, that applies, that doesn't apply, that applies, it doesn't apply. We can play that game. We can lump them in categories and say, ceremonial law, not for us. Moral law is for us. That would be an accurate way of doing things. And there's value to that. But we could also just look to what Jesus says here. Verse 34 of tw chapter 22. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He has 613 to choose from. Pick one. What's the best one? He said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like that. And the lawyer is immediately going to be thinking, no, I only asked you for one. I only asked you for one. But Jesus says, no, there is a second one. There has to be the second one, too. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and prophets. All of Scripture depends on those two things. Love God and love your neighbors. That's the calling. There is no perfection of any sort. There is no righteousness of any sort unless you love God and you love your neighbor. Let us pray. Well, Father God, I thank you for... I thank you for this text. You know, Lord, of course you know that I found this passage difficult. Difficult to navigate, more so than I thought it would. And the more time I spent with it, the less clinical it became. And the less it became about dividing up kinds of laws and explaining the nature of those laws and for us today. And, and Lord, I know those conversations are valuable, but Lord, I think today we begin to get at the heart of what Jesus is trying to teach us here. I think we begin to see these things in a light of the kingdom, in light of new covenant. And Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity to wrestle that with that. Those of us in the body of Christ, 
Lord, we can also often feel removed as body of Christ believers from some of this kingdom language. But Lord, I pray we would find it valuable. I pray we would that we would rightly divide the word of truth here and come to understand the things that are meant for us and perhaps the things that aren't even to understand them in their context, Lord. That we might best pursue Christ. That we might best become like Him as You call us to. That You would be honored and glorified in our pursuit of righteousness and our pursuit of grace that you so freely give us. Lord, I pray that you would move in our hearts and minds this morning and this week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.